Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. Either we are there or not, ITSP Magazine still gets the best stories. There are plenty of conferences and all sorts of events that spark our curiosity and allow us to start conversations with some of the world's brightest minds. In person or virtually, we sit down with them at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Together, we discover what the synergy of these three elements means for the future of humanity. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Hello, everybody. This is Marco Cappelli. Welcome back for one of the latest conversations regarding CES and the coverage that we've done there. Unfortunately, as you know by now, I didn't attend the event in Las Vegas, and I was really bummed about it because I heard it was really, really good. But I'm lucky enough to get to talk to some people that were actually there. They get to walk around to experience all the new technology. And like I said lately, that's where we see the future. It's not just the gadgets anymore. We're actually looking at what the future of the society will look like. And uh, it seems like there is a lot going on, especially artificial intelligence. Everything apparently is driven by that. And this is a conversation that we had in the past as well. And um, I'm going to pick someone's brain again on this uh, conversation, Kate Barekia from Imperva. She was there with a panel and also she took an opportunity to go around and enjoy the show. So vicariously, I'm going to get to go to Las Vegas, too. Uh, Enough chatting about me. Again, this is a a post event for CS. And Kate, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to be here. We got a chance to talk in the past, and I think it was a little bit more cybersecurity oriented, although, of course, that's what you talk uh, about the most. But this time we're going to maybe apply a little bit more to our daily life, Uh, daily life, not just as a company, as a corporate environment, but also as homeowners and people that, I don't know, wear wearables and uh, no matter what, we're dealing with privacy issues. So. In order to introduce who you are to the show, I'll give you a couple of minutes to to do that and uh, what kind of panel you had there as well, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. Um, So I am Kate Barakia. I am Vice President, Deputy General Counsel and Global Data Privacy Officer here at Imperva. And I, I have the great pleasure in my role of expanding privacy rights and putting privacy into action every day. And at CES, I was honored to be invited to speak about safeguarding your sanctuary. So on the panel, we discussed um, some hidden tips and tricks about things in 2024 and beyond that may be happening in your home that might not be front of mind for the average consumer. And that's a really good point. We certainly often get attracted by the benefit of having something and the excitement of something new that's often often happened with technology. And we don't really get many alert or, I don't know, ingredient list and uh, (laughs) and and what is not in our camera, in our lighting, in our everything that we put in the house to open our garage and, and so forth. So... I know I had many conversations in the past, but I feel, you know, even a year in this world of technology, it's a, it's a long time. So where, where are we standing now with that? The consumer is in the position to expect some more privacy and, and control over their identity for what they do online or in the IoT um, system that they have in their house or is still up to them? So I I think in 2024, that still very much depends on where you live and what laws apply to both you and the provider of the services you're receiving. 
So for example, if you are a resident of the European Union, regardless of your citizenship status, if you reside in the European Union, you're protected by GDPR. In 2024, GDPR, the global data privacy regulation, which went into effect in 2018, is still widely considered to be the high watermark for data privacy. And under GDPR, the default rule is that your data is your data and can't be monetized. If you're outside Europe, the rules aren't quite the same. You're on your own? In large part, you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not universally, but it's a good it's a good rule of thumb. I know that California has done something about it and individually other states. But I, to be honest, I would have thought that uh, since GDPR started, there would have been a little bit more trickle down somewhere else. And any idea why it's really not happening? It's interesting because philosophically, privacy laws can sometimes be looked at as a tool of trade war or trade tactic. Mm. And it's unclear to me why the economic costs associated with privacy differentials in privacy laws isn't as apparent to some as it is to others. Are, maybe there are hidden market forces that I simply don't appreciate. Maybe it's inherent objection to government regulation in the United States. It, it is very unclear to me because you can very much look at compliance with GDPR or any other privacy regulation as a tax, like the cost of doing business in a jurisdiction. And you almost have to have different kind of marketing technique and maybe even branding for a company where in the US you don't have to push on the privacy as much as you have to do in Europe, even just to sell your product to the consumer. So it's... I think that's very accurate. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like that. Let's get a little bit more on the specific maybe of the panel that you had. What what point in particular did you cover? Some area that were more interesting for you for the conversation? Yeah, so I, I think one of the areas where our panel had the greatest um Schism might be too strong of a word, but differences in opinion related to the use of home security systems. Um, one of my co-panelists represent, represented a home security company, and he raised some very valid points, one of which was that you know, you try, you trade a little bit of privacy for both convenience and actionable security. So if a company knows when you normally open your door or close your door or can tell you that all your windows are closed, they know more about you. They know when you normally go to bed, they can build a profile on that because you're turning your lights out and they're tracking that. In exchange for that, if something's anomalous, you might be able to get a faster response from the security company if all the lights are thrown on suddenly at 1 a.m. or a door becomes ajar outside of its habitual pattern. But there is a trade. There is always a trade. So one thing that I often end up having conversation about is that we give away a lot of our personal information uh, even if it's most of the time out, not disclosed, it's obfuscated. It's stealthy, sure. Stealth, but always still able to re-aggregate in a way or in another if somebody really <laughs> wants to do that. And we don't get to choose or to be compensated by that. So some people suggest a trade-in. Okay, one can be more security and safety, as you just mentioned. The other one, well, you want to use my information? Do I get a discount? Do I get paid for my data? Uh, did you guys touch on that? We did. Um, in particular, um, some vendors are offering opt-in services where if you'll let them model your data, they'll give you a discount and they use those models ostensibly to improve their products and services for other users, also to manage staffing on their side. So for example, let's say you might be a homeowner in Las Vegas, because that's where CES was. And let's say 
it, it, the security company is able to model your data and the data of a hundred other homeowners and across neighborhoods, across sections of the city. And the home security company starts noticing a trend line, gosh, at 4.35 p.m., we're seeing a statistically higher number of alarms, right? The company can then take action to make sure they have more staff on call to answer those alarms. They might be speaking with the police to say, hey, we're noticing a trend line here. Do you guys want to adjust your patrolling? Things like that, right? And that that can be done for a discount or not for a discount. You know, different companies take different approaches. In Europe, that's actually not considered free consent unless they offer you a pay for model that's just equal without taking your data. Hmm, interesting, interesting. So do you think that we will reach a point where all the user will be kind of treated as equal in terms of the value that we give to our privacy, or there is always some kind of default difference between the cultures that maybe we have in Europe versus the United I think States. there will always be a default difference. Is that driven by the market? Partly driven by the market and partly driven by history. Hmm. Where you see the most strict privacy laws are countries in which the gravest of privacy violations occurred in the past. And so we're fortunate here in the United States that we have not had wide-scale privacy invasions of the nature we've seen in other jurisdictions. And that largely drives that, that lack of local history informs current many of America's current values on privacy because there's no visible harm in most cases. Right, right. Let's go into maybe something that you discuss on the panel and based on your experience, what, what are the, the biggest privacy concern that a user of home, smart home technology should be concerned about nowadays? I might break that into two if it's okay, because I think there's a pretty big privacy concern, and then separately there are some pretty big lurking security concerns. So on privacy, I think it's often hard for a consumer to truly understand the default settings. So for example, if you have a camera doorbell and you don't change some of the settings, some manufacturers by default, some providers of these cameras, automatically share your camera footage with law enforcement and other third parties. You have to opt out instead of opting in. So that's a great example of where people might not always be aware of where their data is going. Because you might think, gosh, unless I opted into something, it's probably just staying with me. And on the security front, many devices include Wi-Fi passwords and other um, cryptographic elements or other keys needed to interact with your home router and Wi-Fi components and the other devices in your home. It, let's say you have a smart light bulb that goes on and off. You know, it's just a light bulb, right? The LED goes out after a while. You throw it out. Well, a lot of that data is still left in the light bulb. The light bulb goes into the trash, you sort of, you know, would you throw out your house key? No, but you've sort of thrown out a key. <laughs> it's interesting. And I, and I think right now, a lot of people that especially follow the Redefining Society podcast instead of the cybersecurity one, with, where they may be a little bit more aware of this, they're probably like, wait a minute. What did you just say? Yeah. <laughs> my dad's are <laughs> in somebody in my trash, but somebody can just pick it up. Like if it was a letter with all my social security, IRS, and all that. That's kind of right. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's interesting. I had to take that's a deep breath, you know, because that's that's a hard one, right? Because am I sitting here smashing with a hammer every microchip that's ever been in my house? Can I really trust the electronics recycling provider that I've called? You know, you never know. And that's the, the thing of trust. Like, how do you choose? And, and I think we can, we can pivot into the regulatory system here. You know, if we leave it to the market, I feel like it's often going to be an 
you're opt-in by default, not opt-out. And then it's up to you to change the setting. If that goes with a smart TV. You made already the example of the camera. And I feel like it's everything. I mean, even a, a smartphone, if you start looking at the setting, you realize that, oh, I had that on for, I don't know, a few months. And I didn't know that that was even on. And so do we have some opportunity, on your opinion, from a le regulatory perspective to improve this kind of, again, following what the GDPR is doing and the European community? Or what can we do at a federal level here? Yeah, I think there's great opportunity, whether we'll have the political will um, and whether the populace has interest in driving transformation at the federal level, I think is is an open question, right? Because I think if you ask, you know, your audience here is interested in privacy, presumably, right? They've self-selected into this conversation. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure that the majority of Americans are interested in privacy. And that's understandable. It's often considered a complicated topic of low risk, right? And so... I think something will have to change in the political environment for there to be transformation at the federal level. So when something is implemented, like in California, for example, we mentioned it before, you don't think the public opinion is going to react somehow and say, hey, if they did it there, maybe there is a reason why not? Why not look in a little bit more into this and so create that public opinion pressure to legislate or maybe in other states to, to do the same thing? Yeah, so we are seeing, so from memory, California came into effect roughly 2020. That's my recollection. And maybe some things were phased in over 2021. It's been a minute since I've looked at the timing. Yeah. But so let's say ballpark three to four years california has been in effect if we look since then roughly somewhere i'd ballpark it at 10 to 15 states offhand have entered their own privacy laws they're all very different from california some of them have aspects that are more closely tailored to gdpr but most of them are picking what I would call the lower hanging fruit and not addressing the thornier issues of where businesses tend to monetize data on the consumer data aggregation front and elsewhere. Hmm. Interesting. So until that day that we can have something a little bit more regulated when it comes to the IoT and the smart homes and even wearable, I guess, that's another really uh, interesting topic eventually to touch because having a watch that monitor pretty much everywhere you go, everything you do, your, your heartbeat, your health, that's another interesting thing. But uh, what can the regular user that may not be that much interested in privacy, but when you hear that the light bulb may know a lot more than <laughs> what you think, or I had not too long ago a conversation about the report from... Um, from the Mozilla organization in terms of what the cars know about you. And cars that, know a lot. That was some scary episode right there. <laughs> you want yeah. to see a Black Mirror episode? You should listen to that one. <laughs> so what can we do as, uh, you know, like, I don't know if you go in a rental car or but, but this is even your own car. Like you plug it in, you connect to whatever system in the car. And then where does those data go? When you unplug your phone or when you don't have that car anymore, is that going to be like the light bulb or way worse than that, probably? Yeah, so that is a great question. I don't feel like I have a full comprehension of all of the data fields that that car is taking from my phone. I did. Uh, it's funny because my husband and I, he's in IT also, um, he and I had this conversation this summer. We rented um, a large car to fit our family and we drove up to Cape Cod with our two dogs and three kids. Mm -hmm. And that's a much longer drive and bigger drive than our ordinary car could handle. So we rented, you know, a ginormous vehicle. <laughs> And it 
uh, the vehicle only had maybe, I want to say, less than 2,000 miles on it. So it's a very new vehicle. We, we were happy with it. And we, uh, we delayed for probably a couple hours, allowing the car to sync because we wanted to think about it. And we noticed that other users had left their sync data behind. So the first thing I did was I did them a solid and deleted their profiles because they don't belong in the car. And then um, at, we did ultimately sync because the conveniences of having the sync for that long a drive outweighed the privacy risk in my mind. And we did delete our profiles from the car. And hopefully that deleted the remnants of the data. Now, could it be residing on a chip in another section somewhere? It could. Of course, mm -hmm. but you know, it is that balance between convenience and ultimate security. I can live, I can dig myself a bunker in the back of my yard and be as secure as possible, but then I can't live my life. Mm -hmm. And so you're always constantly every day making a trade-off between what, what limits you're willing to put on your privacy and your convenience. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, and that especially come true with health, for example. Like if, if you're using a wearable that is benefiting your health, you need to weight the risk of compromise and versus the benefit of an improved health output for yourself. So, but I think that there are still few maybe checklist point that somebody could go over when you get a new camera or I like, guess you did, uh, you know, the, the car, at least think about it and, and see if there is some settings that may be not necessary and you still get the benefit out of that. Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Yeah. And, um, you know, so I, I can give you another example, yeah. right? I used to do um, one of those insurance discount programs where I got 10% off my insurance if they could track my driving style. I stopped doing that when they stopped changing, when they um, updated their app to say it needed to track my location all the time, mm -hmm. even when I'm not using the app. And I was like, well, tell me why you would need that. You don't. It's poor privacy and poor coding. You mm -hmm. don't need to know if I'm walking around the mall. You don't need to know anything except what's relevant to our contract. Unless you're going to give me a discount of whatever store I'm about to walk in. <laughs> <laughs> Which could match the discount you're getting on the car. And so, okay, maybe I'm okay with that. Right. Uh, talking about walking around, I want to take the last few minutes uh, with this uh, kind of recap for CES by getting uh, a couple of opinions from you on how you... What did you see around, uh, I know we, we know CES and maybe the listener may not understand, but it, this thing is huge. It's the biggest technology, consumer technology event in the world. And uh, I guess you need to pick your own bottles. You're going to go to the Eureka where you see the startup, or you're going to go to see the space technology, the, the, the food, the, the health. I mean, there is technology for everything. Where did you decide to go and... Uh, did you see something that were like, okay, this is a game changer. I am kind of a really enjoying this coming into our society or something that are like, I really didn't think this was going to come and I was hoping it didn't. <laughs> um, yeah, so you're right. It is really enormous. I actually walked from my hotel to the Las Vegas Convention Center and I was staying down at the far end of the strip. And so it took me for perspective, it was about a 45 minute walk. Now maybe I walk like a glacier, but it was, <laughs> it was a long walk. And I had the opportunity to pass, they had separate exhibits at the Venetian, which I visited on another day, cause that's where my panel was. So I did go, the Venetian had more um, things focused on the home and then, um, I was in the Las Vegas Convention Center first, and I saw, um, I think health was there, but I could be mixing it up. But I did see the, uh, uh, whether it was in one building or the other, I saw home, health, um, some of the startups, and automotive, and then um, I would say assorted, whether they were... Um, 
droids, you know, the flying droids mm -hmm. and, Drone. um, and drones, yes, and also underwater drones um, were, were some of, and also robots, you know, the self-driving robots that go around. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. So somebody has been telling me throughout this whole conversation that their prediction, while it was the year of uh, generative artificial intelligence in the, the past year with the with the debut, the crazy debut of ChatGPT, they, they're saying that the next one is going to be about robotics, like the biggest change will probably come from that. I can't even think about the privacy issue that we will have with eventually robotics that will kind of help us clean the house or who, who knows what they will do. And any, any thought on that? Just putting your futuristic hat on? I think it's going to be not so different than the security system conversation, right? Does, does the vacuum cleaner really need to call home 700 times a day because it bumped into my bed frame? Mm -hmm. Right. We have those concerns now with the robots. If you were to check how many times they called home and what they communicated back to their mothership. Mm -hmm. um, mine also died. So I'm sad about that. But, <laughs> but did maybe it, really, did it, it really did. Die? It did. Is it, it has no still, power. It's not still sending some signal. even Maybe. <laughs> maybe like a long lost signal into <laughs> outer space. Come. It's dirty here. <laughs> um <laughs> But I, I think I think it's just going to be an evolution of the conversation that we've been having, whether it's with your phone, right, or or a robot. It's the same, sim very similar data, same concerns, just a different species. Different species. There we are. In a, is an alien species. And, and it comes down again to what you said before, which is the convenience. Because uh, I always bring this example of if you have a personal assistant, human species, yeah, personal assistant, and, and you want to really be of help, you need to share your taste, you need to share your habit, you need to share your schedule, and you need to share many things, and then it can be effective. So it kind of applies to that. I mean, if you want the AI assistant or the robotics assistant to be very useful. There is that line that you kind of need to trust. And so I think it goes into trust. I already said that. But uh, as long as I know that those data that I share and those information, they stay in a container that doesn't bleed somewhere else where I don't want to, then I think that's how we're going to get the benefit. So I, I don't know. Do you agree that maybe the bottle is is into the in the trust field with the company you work with? I agree. It is about trust. And I think that some major brands have recognized that that's where the future battle will lie. And they recognized it many years ago. Some companies have taken it all the way to the Supreme Court. They will not intercede if their customer has put a privacy setting on other companies feel different philosophically. And so we, we as consumers can choose to purchase from companies whose values better align with ours, whichever side you're on. Right. And then the market can really make the difference. Well, a lot to think about. Uh, Kate, I really appreciate your time. It's always great to talk to you and to our friends at the Imperva team as well. And uh, um, I think the next big event uh, that we will cross path again will probably be RSA conference. I don't know if with you personally, but I'm sure with the, <laughs> with the team. And uh, it, that the conversation is a little bit different, but I think where when you talk about technology, you're talking about cybersecurity nowadays, and that include privacy, it include um, identity and a lot of other interesting things that maybe we're too lazy or we don't want to worry about it as a consumer but i would say definitely to all the listener maybe you want to look at the setting every time you get some new blinking light and funny noise gadget that you really like and you really want to have in your house so kate again thank you so much uh, for being part of this and everybody else stay tuned for more coverage actually uh, post cs coming up to you and then uh, our next coverage which will be RSA conference 2024 thank you again thank you
We hope you enjoyed this episode of our On Location Conversation. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSBmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG 24.